Yeah, uh, we are working on this project as a team, and uh, I will request my friend Savannah to present the first part, then I will go to the technical part. Thank you, good afternoon. So my name is Savannah, I am working here until July and uh, Harold and Erwin have been kind enough to allow me to work on the Maresha plow and the conversion of the Maresha plow into a direct seeder for use in conservation agriculture. So I will introduce the Maresha plow a little bit, but the majority of the presentation will be modifications to the Maresha to turn it into a direct seeder. And that's the longer part of the presentation because only God does it right the first time. So I'll tell you about the different prototypes. Um, but the Maresha plow originated in Ethiopia and it is drawn by a pair of donkeys or oxen. And Neil Miller brought it here to ECHO in 2018 where he was working um, with the staff of engineers and farmers here to modify it um, as a conservation ag technology um, to allow minimum tillage and seed um, at the same time. So in Ethiopia, this plow is used over the same piece of land, crisscrossed, maybe three or five times. But in our usage, we only want to go over the land once to disturb the soil as least as possible. So as I said, we brought it to ECHO for use as conservation agriculture to make closely spaced furrows with minimum soil disturbance. Some of our goals are up on the screen. We want the plow to be easy to use for both men and women farmers. And the engineering team allowed me to drive it because they wanted to make sure somebody who is not very strong is able to use the Marisha plow. So I can say it is usable. We also want it to be easy to maintain by the farmers or the local engineers. Easy to build and then at a very low cost, so less than 100 US dollars or 225,000 Tanzanian shillings. We've heard a lot about conservation agriculture this week, so I won't talk too much on this. But the two things that we're most interested in is that the traditional agriculture is weakening the land by reducing resilience against water and wind erosion as we're stirring up the soil. And of course, killing off many of the microbes that are in the soil as the soil is being overturned by a traditional plow and exposed to the sun and the elements. So at this point, I will be talking about the design and I'll be giving this over to Harold. Thank you. Thank you, Savannah. So we started the design, I mean, making the first prototype exactly like the one which is in, uh, used in Ethiopia. So when Neil came with picture, he came with one a photo and also he came with some tools, some metal parts of the Maresha. So we put it together just to develop the first Maresha. And these are the dimensions or measurements. Then we came up with the first prototype and we went to test it out the field. And we just used the materials that are available in our area. And our first initial idea was to develop a one point reaper, but also we are interested to make a four points for the first trial. Our first Point Reaper was tested and performed well as a minimum tillage reaper. 
on unplowed ground. However, the four-point farrowing tool broke. The picture to the right side is show the four-point. I mean, tool which broke. So the team agreed to modify tools and fabricate them out of metal instead of wood. So the, we came up, we went back after getting the feedback from the first uh, test and then we developed the second prototype. And this was specifically for to check the performance of the four-point farrowing tool, which had been improved based on the feedback from the first. So we introduced the adjustable points made out of the automobile springs. And during the test, we found that on the cloud ground, it worked very well, but on unplowed, did not go deep enough. We found that the farrowing tool need diagonal support. So we went ahead and come up with the third version, of which now we concentrated on one point only. We just leave the four points, we'll come back to that later, but we went on the first point, I mean the one point, I mean in cedar. So the third test, we include the Madison CD metering device from Madison Company. Madison Company gave us to CD metering devices. And we designed a rolling basket as a team and, if I, and the, used the local fabricator to, to develop that one. We had some results of the third test that we made in the field. We found that the rolling basket was working well. And additionally, we found that it needed adjustable mechanism because we couldn't control the depth. So that was the observation. But again, our chain and the sprockets were not working very well. They were pulling out. So we had also a problem of consistent seed spacing. So we went back to make another version. In the first version, we increased the number of our team, including the farmers and the many other people, so to get more ideas. And we found the first prototype after including the feedback that we received from the previous version, the prototype was working much better. We reallocated the CD metering system, we, 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 we provided the, a guide, we, we add brushes, and we painted it so that it can be attractive. That was the, the picture there shows the fourth version. The results were the driving system and the guide performed well, point adjusting system worked very well, but it needed some adjustments again. We had a problem of CD dropping pipe now. The seed in the pipe were blocking. So we went back to address the problem and we came up with the fifth version. This version included the metal pipe instead of plastic. The pipe was faced backward to keep it from getting clogged with soil. And the farmers were interested when they see the way it was working. 
This was the team which was working on the fifth version. Now we came up with the sixth version. I hope everybody saw it yesterday. This prototype features uh, a change in location of the seed drop pipe. We make sure that the seed is just dropping just near to the furrow opener. The press wheel is larger, 50 centimeters, and the new interchangeable sprockets. This bullet number three was very important because our the question which came out from the fifth I mean the test was how do the farmer going to change the spacing? Because the one which we had was 15 centimeters. This was suitable for beans only, for beans and the other legumes. But we had a problem of spacing with maize. So we were thinking, the team was thinking hard how they can attain this I mean, system so that the farmer can change from beans to maize and then maize from easily without needing much technical input. So changing, idea of changing the sprockets solved this problem. The point where you see number three there is where we have number of sprockets and this can be changed and there is a spring which can tighten the, the, the chain. So no problem, we think this will work very well. Optional cutter to reduce number of weeds. We are thinking about that and easier transport of our increased durability because we are using much stronger parts and metal. That is the end of the work that we are doing. We are doing it with, with, as a team. We have learned that it is important to include farmers or users of the technology. We are not designing for them. We are designing with them. Local farmers are part of our team. We sit together and we have technical team, we have, we have also included the engineering students from Marusha Technical College. These young engineers, we want to trans, we want them to change their mind instead of thinking of very high technology for our farmers. They should learn on how to work with farmers to design with them. So we are working with the team and we have seen the very good value. It is like now in our team, everybody is feeling proud that is part of the technology. Local fabricators are very key. We are, we are working with them together. And because of that, people, these people have, they are actually they are keeping in mind the institutional memo, memory of what we are going through until when the, our equipment will be working. We are, it is very promising. Our way forward is we are looking forward to use motorcycle parts because the motorcycle parts are available. As, I, as, as Savannah mentioned before, we want materials and the actually parts to be available just in the near shop. We want local fabricator to take this role and we want farmers to provide their input. We want farmers to test and give the real feedback. Next, tomorrow we'll be testing this sick prototype, I mean version. Please come and provide your inputs as well. Thank you. Another thing we saw in Lokisale was a tractor done ripper. Um, one of the ones that uh, you saw a picture of a similar one there. And 
they told us the price, I think, was around between five and six thousand dollars with the Ripper alone. And I just wanted to re reiterate that one of the real goals that we have in this is to, to produce something that's cheap enough that local farmers can afford it. Most of the zero-till planters that are available, even Oxtron planters, are in the $500 to $1,500 range cost-wise. And as I think Savannah mentioned, our goal is to produce a minimum till planter for under $100. So that's an ambitious goal, <laughs> but I really appreciate um, how Harold has been um, very conscientious about that and has, has really worked hard um, toward that goal. So, but it, it's not easy to do when, when you have to make do with local materials and local fabricators. There are lots of challenges. Bongera. <laughs> yeah. I have one or two questions. Um, well, the first, I congratulate you folks for working on trying to keep costs down. I think that's good. Don't aim too low, though, <laughs> that you tr you know you don't have durable materials. So better to have it durable than too cheap. That would be my advice. Second of all, do you folks have any kind of a timeline on, on when you might get this out to some local fabricators? I'm assuming you're looking to scale it up. Uh, within a few months, do you anticipate that you'll be having some local fabricators manufacturing versions of this? It'll come out of the prototype stage. I, will, I would like to respond on that. Our next plan is, after tomorrow's test, we are going to convene as a team. I have already shared with some people here who, who are part of our team that would like to, this season, maybe with, uh, with this season we want to produce another version which will take to, which will be used by the farmer, my group of farmers. And we will be monitoring them there, it will give us feedback. Yeah. That is what we are planning. And by this season you mean before the March rain? Exactly. So then after that, it might go to manufacturing later in the year? Sure. Okay. Yeah, the Maharesha as a ripper um, is operational now. And I, I should we should mention price on that. You can build the whole ripper for about $10. And, and we have lots of farmers that are interested in that, and we're doing training on that now. It's the planter. That's the bigger challenge. Over here, uh, just a comment or a suggestion of a resource with the uh, young engineers. There's a book titled The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid. If you take the wealth of the world and put it in a pyramid, 90% of all products are designed for the top third, the most wealthy in the world. But the author, who was a, a professor at University of Michigan, I believe, C.K. Prahalad, is challenging organizations, corporations, to recognize there's an incredible amount of wealth because of numbers at the bottom of the pyramid. And products like this that are designed for a large majority of the world can be incredibly profitable but a lot of times our engineering students are only thinking because that's how they're taught about that top of the pyramid. So the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid would be a resource that I would recommend, you might recommend to those engineering students. Just even on the Maresha, you folks, can you give a blueprint or... <laughs> Uh, how, do, how would people make it? Because I'm assuming the angles and the length and all those things are important, even if it looks simple. Um, is ECHO or CA program somebody going to be making a, a drawing? I've not seen one that has the technical specs. I, I think we, we have one drawing which we've made with Savannah. 
trying to put all the dimensions after seeing it working. So we have the dimensions and the, we are ready to give this to the other people. We are happy to see that many people are trying this technology and being used by the local farmers and local fabricators. Thanks. Um, thanks for your presentation and I love to see the Maresha because it's a, it's a great tool that dates back thousands of years. Um, with the Maresha, you're typically using it, I'm assuming, in soils that are relatively soft? So they've been wet up and okay. Because I was just thinking a lot of the arguments for, say, like the Mogoye Ripper out of Zambia was that you would use it during the dry season to actually break the hard pan, but you were doing it when the soil was quite hard. And I was wondering, can a Maresha stand up to that sort of tillage in heavy soils? Thank you. So, as you know, where it's used in Ethiopia, there are lots of heavy clay soils, and typically they're plowing through their dry season there. It's an amazingly, it's much tougher than it looks. When people see this wooden plow, they think, oh, well, you know, that can't, um, can't possibly make it under our conditions. That said, we haven't tried it in, you know, umpteen locations. Um, I'm sure there are soils where I, I think the big challenge will be penetration, keeping it deep in the soil on, on some soils. Um, well, I think it depends. Do you need to get it that deep or can you just scratch? I think it depends a lot on, on the soil conditions. The one thing I point out, and, and I hear this question quite a bit, and the one thing I point out is that if we're using conservation agriculture, and cover crops and improving soil quality, those soils are getting softer and easier to till every year. So um, it may be tough initially if you're starting with a low organic matter. You know, the worst soils are the, are the sandy clays, the ones that have both sand and clay, and when they get dry, they're just like concrete. And it may very well not work. But the Maguey, I, I can say for me, from experience, Maguey rippers don't work in those conditions either. Um, you have to go over it two, three times and you're still, your oxen are complaining, but, um, so I, you know, those, those questions remain to be answered as we roll this out more widely, but, but I think in general, I mean, Ethiopian farmers fine-tuned this tool over, as you said, thousands of years, and it's, it's a remarkable tool. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. My question is not necessary to be answered by you because there is a lot of people that have do CA. I want to ask that when you conduct any CA by using those, those machines, up to the, the coming season, are we using the same line or you have to, to use another line? Also, in the other side, if other people are using holes like that in, the, in that pamphlet, <laughs> at the coming season, are they using the same hole or dig another hole? Also, if with the same hole, how about the the changing of crop with different distance. Thank you. Um, you've asked a very, very good question and a question on which there is some disagreement. Um, proponents of conservation agriculture, especially in southern Africa where it really began in Africa, promote um, reuse of the same basin season after season to develop a high level of soil fertility in those planting basins. But as you pointed out very in, insightfully, if you plant another crop with a different spacing, you can't use that basin. And m most of the projects I work with here in East Africa, we don't worry about returning to the same basin year after year. Um, 
I think, and I haven't worked in Southern Africa to, to explain why they prefer those methods, but I think very possibly in some soils which are very, very hard, like I was talking about, um, and very poor fertility, low pH, those kinds of things, it may be advantageous to stay in the same basins year after year, just because it's so difficult to till outside of those basins. But again, you face this problem that you, you brought up about if you're, if you're rotating crops, if you're intercropping, then you can't use those same basins. So it's a, it's a difficult question. Um, I think, again, as, as soils get softer and healthier under CA, um, it's much easier to plant either in different basins or in many of the projects I work with, once the soil becomes softer and healthier, we don't even dig basins at all. We can just plant with a panga or a dibble stick and um, we, we get a good crop that way.